In light of the lengthy introductions that Barbara and Tracy got, I just feel compelled to talk a little more expansively about my accomplishments. <laughs> so, allow me to pick up where Steve left off. I served as treasurer of the Chicago Literary Club. I was relieved of those duties. But there was never any direct evidence of embezzlement. <laughs> Just a general concern that something was wrong because under my tenure, the endowment was going up instead of down. <laughs> I was then appointed, for reasons I did not understand, to serve without distinction on the Committee for Publications to help select papers which were worthy of being printed. I was relieved of those duties. Once again, no direct evidence of wrongdoing. Yes, yes, there was some talk that I had introduced a pay-to-play politics system <laughs> in picking papers, but they never proved it. <laughs> Instead, there was just this general feeling that somehow I had become a persona au gratin. <laughs> <laughs> On the positive side, I would like to take sole unilateral credit to the success of these joint annual meetings between the Fortnite <laughs> and the Chicago Literary Club. This tradition commenced 19 years ago, on March 8, 1996. The theme that night was Rascals. I presented an essay on my favorite British fictional childhood hero, William, who appeared in the Richmond Crompton series of children books. The series included 40 titles such as More William, William Again, William the Fourth, William the Conqueror, William and the Artist Model, Still William, William and the Moon Rocket. My talk that night, if I say so myself, was such a tour de force that a decision was made on the spot to make this an annual event. More importantly, that night, a number of ladies in the Fort Knightley, you know who you are, and I'm not going to kiss and tell, <laughs> spontaneously declared themselves to be Howard Krosnitz groupies. <laughs> it has taken me 19 years to claw my way back to this podium. <laughs> I am confident that after what I have to say in my remaining remarks, that there will be no third appearance. <laughs> I, I am here, unlike my fellow presenters, solely for crass commercial reasons. <laughs> to sell as many copies as possible of my recently completed novel, The Ponzi Scheme. <laughs> The story is about Jake Farley, a graduate of Stanford Law School. For seven years, he slaves away night and day at a prestigious firm in the Sears Tower, only to be unceremoniously fired via closed circuit television by presiding partner Dake Snake. <laughs> Jake goes home early to find his lovely wife, Diane, in the shower with her personal trainer from the East Bank <laughs> Jake is forced to set up a loft office in the remnants of a West Loop brassiere factory. <laughs> oh my God. He is then called in the middle of the night to the Deutsche National Hygiene Museum in Dresden to solve a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme mystery. On his hunt, for dangerous international financial criminals, he ends up making a boatload of money and meets a captivating 
dark-haired German temptress. But can she be trusted? He puts aside all his fears due to her large breasts. <laughs> In short, this novel is my autobiography. <laughs> My wife and daughter, <laughs> who learned manners at Vassar, that's in Poughkeepsie, <laughs> said it would be gauche for me to just sell the book tonight. So I'm going to give it away, at least four <laughs> copies. So look under your seat if there is a plain brown envelope under your seat. It is pornography, it is my novel. <laughs> about yourself and promote your book? Yes? I do jest, and my name is not Shirley. So permit me to abruptly transition to the remaining subject of my talk, which is some stories of jest about my mother. The year is 1929. It is early evening on a spring day. We are looking at the outside of a red brick girls' boarding school in Essex, England. A third floor window opens up and a 13-year-old girl sticks her head out to check to make sure the coast is clear. Satisfied, she carefully lowers a rope of knotted bed sheets to the ground and descends. Moments later, a second girl makes her way down. Girl number one would become an actress on the London stage. Girl number two was named Megan Davey and would become my mother. Together, the pair go off into town to the local beauty salon. When they come back, the entrance gates to the school are locked. And on the other side is an angry head mistress. Both of the girls are now sporting perms as a result of a complicated new technology involving electric heating rods. <laughs> the prior process had relied upon a mixture of cow urine and water. <laughs> While the salon treatments had gone well, the headmistress behind the gates was not amused. May I be so bold as to inquire where you young ladies have been? Need I remind you that this is a British public school, which means that it is private. <laughs> Our mission is to take girls of the upper middle class and teach them manners, how to make tea, how to talk, how to be ladies. Yes, Mum, but we thought to be proper young ladies, we should get our hair done, and this was the only available appointment time. <laughs> Surely you just. <laughs> The punishment doled out for that incident did not deter my mother from further adventures in her adolescence. One time she rode her horse up to a local country pub, tied the horse to a railing, went inside, told the bartender to take a break, and proceeded to serve free drinks to everybody. <laughs> Fast forward to early 1939. Hitler has not yet invaded Poland. Most of Europe is fleeing westward. My mother, however, is on a train going east <laughs> towards Poland to marry a man she had met in the forestry program in London. She had studied there to, in hopes of taking over her father's lumber business. She started talking with an individual on the train whom she perceived to be a tour guide because he was wearing a bunch of official-looking ribbons. <laughs> The trip involved a night stopover in Berlin. The guide offered to take her on a tour of Berlin's nightclubs. She said yes. At the end of the night, when they got back to the train station, she asked how much she owed him for the tour. He responded by saying, Fräulein, 
Officers in the Gestapo do not accept gratuities. <laughs> the Schurzen Wohl, German for you know what. Uh, things did not go well with her Polish husband. He had extreme political views and spent every waking hour thinking about how to bring down the Communist Party. My mother wanted to get back to England, but did not know how, since most of England had now fallen to the, excuse me, most of Europe had now fallen to the Nazis. She contacted her father, who told her to get a Peruvian passport, and said that he could get her back to England if she made it as far as Rome. That plan worked. Back in England, she switched from forestry to nursing. She met my father and wanted to marry him, but her Polish husband was refusing to give her a divorce. Once again, she went to her father. His advice was simple. Become a member of the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> the, the man will divorce you immediately. <laughs> that plan worked. <laughs> After the war, my parents wanted to emigrate to the United States. It was the height of the McCarthy period. The only problem was that my mother was now a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Once again, she went to her father for advice. He said, go to the American Embassy, tell them you didn't really believe any of it, communist mumbo-jumbo, and you just joined the party for love in order to get a divorce. <laughs> she went to the embassy. The diplomat responded in French, the international language of diplomacy. Sûrement vous plaisantez. You know what that means. And she got in. So there are plenty of adventures at Evanston growing up. Time does not permit me to go into them. So let me go ahead to uh, what happened after my father died. My mother continued to travel throughout the world. One of her good set of traveling companions were Dick and Mickey Woodruff, who had been fox hunting companions. When they were all well into their mid-80s, they decided to go.